a sentence. I love you, Isaac. Peace of Christ, you dear. By the power of Jesus, I bind all evil spirits. Those not of the Holy Spirit. My name is Dale Jillick. I grew up in North Dakota, and I was blessed to have a Catholic family. And after my high school studies, I went to college in North Dakota. I spent a year in a seminary, in a minor seminary, and I discerned out, as it's said. And then I joined the Army. And during that time is when I met my wife, who had been in the Army, and we got married. So for 23 years, we spent that time in the Army, and we just recently retired. And here we are in Augusta, Georgia, with our 10 children. My name is Adia Jillick. I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, to my dad, Fletcher Rivers, who was in the Navy, and my mother, Glenda. My parents were both Baptist, and my Mother did take us to church on Sunday, and every Saturday when we cleaned, she played gospel around the house. So we, uh, you know, it was very enjoyable in my youth to grow up with that. And my father would read scripture to us. My younger brother was born when I was 10, and that's it's pretty soon after that my mother got sick. So a lot of things changed. We had this firm knowledge that my parents loved us very much. Um, even though they may have had difficulties or my father got laid off, but those things helped ground us. And uh, I also think that's why I enjoyed the Catholic faith. And I came to it because it reminded me of something deep that my I think my parents had some idea of. My wife preceded me to the duty station, Fort Campbell in Kentucky. And I didn't meet my wife very quickly, but I heard a lot of the people in the Army unit speak very admiringly of her. So when she finally arrived, I made sure to to introduce myself to her. There was a time she was actually my squad leader, so she was my supervisor at a time. And I joked that the only way that I could ever outrank her was by ma making her my wife, but I don't know that that worked out so well. I was a single mother when I met Dale. I was told that I should get an abortion because I was not married. And it was very difficult to not listen to that. I was alone. I sat in my room and I prayed. And I did not get an abortion, but didn't make life easy being a single mom in the military. Um, I re-enlisted and went to college. And that's coming back is when I met my husband. We were very good friends. And I really enjoyed his personality. He was very intelligent, very eloquent, easy to speak with. And I knew I could trust him with things that were going, was going on in my life. When he said that he was Catholic, that's when I had issues because I was not Catholic. And I had to figure out why. And he took me to Mass. I still didn't understand. I wanted to take my scripture along. And he's like, Catholics don't do that. <laughs> I couldn't quite understand why, but um, so we went. And it wasn't until he took me to the Blessed Sacrament when he just said, just kneel and I'll see you later. That moment when he left me in the Blessed Sacrament by myself, I knew that Jesus was present for the first time. So I became Catholic over time and, um, and I figured my husband, had been such a good friend to me, and it made sense, it made sense that God would choose marriage for us. You're a woman of great depth and character when it comes to her faith, and it's really wonderful. I did not know that I wanted this many kids from the beginning. Actually, after our third child was born, I had a dream that I had six children. And I remember in that dream, I said, Lord, I can't do six children. I don't know how one does six children. <laughs> and it's just interesting how each child comes and you have more power, more ability, more energy. But I guess we are finding out who we really are by how many children we have, how we relate to them as well. What's great about 
being a mom and dad to these many children is that we know there's really no end in sight. So we're always learners. So it's, our relationship is always refreshed because we always have some current excitement, drama, problem, something to bind us. Well, it makes for an interesting journey so that we have to now rediscover what it's like to love. Jabari is 26. So Jabari has always been very patient, very careful to not offend anybody, but very sensitive he's been. He's a writer, he's an engineer. Joseph has been precocious, as Dale said, from the beginning. He's been yeah. energetic and... He's precocious, he's demanding. He loves people. He will interact with anybody. And he'll remember things about people. He's sensitive to their needs now. Uh, he's developed this kind of understanding how to get along, and he's very good at it. As the older siblings grow older, it's like the younger siblings have more parents and there's less actual children to take care of. I get to experience parenting more from the perspective of my parents than from the perspective of a younger sibling and I feel that it actually prepares me for life in a more meaningful way. Miriam. Uh, she's looking at university. Uh, yeah. She's been able to play music from a very early age. She's been able to draw from a very early age. She sat down at the piano and put her fingers on the keys and said, I see colors. The colors were the keys that she needed to play for a song. She has a very good ability. Being the oldest girl in such a big family is quite a responsibility. But I mean, it's cool because I'm going to be the best mom out of my sisters now. <laughs> Benedict comes along and he can be everybody's favorite because he's just so easy to get along with. Benedict is very intentional about his talents. He loves to play the violin. The best part I'd say is uh, babysitting Steve and our infant. It makes me feel like I'm gonna be a better parent because of it. My ministry as an altar server is something that has uh, greatly increased my faith, mainly because I feel so close to Jesus in the sacrament of the altar and I really do feel privileged. Kateri, she stands in the middle of the gap between the oldest and the youngest. She's 14. She really does take control of the younger kids and uh, she does it in a very fun way. She makes up scenarios. Kateri loves fairy tales and so anytime the kids need to be told anything, she's like, I got a story and she will hold their attention the whole time. She thinks she wants to be an architect because she loves math. And building. My favorite things are playing with my younger siblings. I like to read stories to them and tell them stories that I make up. Well, the blessings are that you're more used to relating with people like that because you have older siblings as well. I personally love being in a big family. Um, Lucy, who is 12, she's a culinary artist. She loves anything having to do with putting flavors together, and it really is a scientific thing for her. And she likes to make it look beautiful. Um, she'll do flower arrangements. She, she'll organize something in our house to make it look more pretty. She's just visually gifted that way. I also enjoy cooking with my mom and sisters. Baking is especially fun, you know, cookies and cakes, I do enjoy that a lot, and decorating them when they're done is very fun. Then there's Fulton, who is 10, and Fulton is passionate. He's been passionate from the beginning. He's fire. 
but he's extremely articulate. He loves to read. Um, he's even seen himself becoming a priest one day, and he's, he's like a soldier's man. He's the one who, if we had one to play the mass, and all of his older siblings and younger were quick to indulge that. So it was very admirable, all everybody getting involved and setting up the mass for him. Being in a big family, like we have many people to fill it. When I was younger, I would think how irritating it would be sometimes, the way they might act. But now that I am older, I see a way out of just not being irritated. They're still young and they're still trying to find their way through their own lives. I'm always seeing new things every year of my life, and it's actually very encouraging to have a big family. We have Isaac, who's eight. He's very sweet, very kind. Very mild. Very mild. Um, if, uh, he's sunshine. And he's definitely a peacemaker. Jonathan, who's our six-year-old. And Jonathan is fiery, but ultimately sweet. He just is learning how to control his passions, and he ultimately just wants everybody to be happy. And he's willing to do what it takes to get that. And then we have our Bridget, who's gonna be three. And she is very powerful, very independent. And she does not want a lot of help, and she does not want to be coddled or um, made into a weak, uh, a weak version of herself. So she's very confident. And we have Stephen, who's five months old, and he's just a beautiful baby. <laughs> The saying about that your example is speaking so loudly that I can't hear what you're saying, there's a, a certain point you step out of, let's say, the van and all of the kids go with you and you don't realize that you're making that impact on a viewer or somebody you're speaking with because they're just seeing, wait, what's, what's before me here? Because it's just a little bit countercultural and very unique. And plus the kids, to see the kids from high to low, every two years you've got a different stage of cuteness or maturity or complexity, which is what you know our life in the house is. It keeps us always just a little bit off balance so that we can mature more spiritually as people and parents. You're never going to have a day when everything works out. In light of that, everybody should wake up and recognize if we don't pray, that's probably added to the problems that you're going to have. Your mission is forming souls, and you have something to offer. You are not just a physical being to create life. So that has been a challenge because you're so necessary to everything functioning from potty training, to nursing, to making meals, to figuring out what the next school day will look like, to making sure your husband has everything he needs. And I would say that that for me has been the biggest challenge. So the children themselves have to help us solve these issues. I think what's interesting is I see my children doing a lot of the things that I personally would like to do and finding a way to enjoy them doing it almost feeds back what I wish I had, but then I find that I am actually doing it with them. Our 20-year-old, he can fix anything. It's just innate in him. He could, he could take anything apart and know how to put it back together. To watch him do that, to be with him when he does it, for him to explain it to us is life. It's life. I wouldn't trade me doing it for him doing it. Homeschooling, what we like to call family formation, we took on the challenge without really understanding how to do it. 
And that started actually, well, we need to teach how to read, so let's do morning prayer. And by doing the breviary, we taught the children how to read. And so interesting, over the years, we developed a little chorus, so now we can have two groups and <laughs> of, of family prayer, which is neat. And then when we sing, um, we have a little chorus again. But prayer was definitely, and Mass, definitely a part of our homeschooling experience that gave us times to do things. So if we didn't pray, if we didn't go to Mass, I think it would be harder to manage our days. It would be harder to know what we should accomplish study-wise, what our goals ought to be. So we have to struggle in this environment as a group to do this together. And perhaps like if you were studying grammar, we like to have punctuations in appropriate places so that right. we don't have run-on sentences. I think when you do things like this with the, the breveries, you are putting punctuations. And you're saying, now it's time to take a pause. Now it's time to reflect. And that's, that's wise. That's the church's wisdom. You really have to be very intentional about their formation because a lot of the assumptions, they're not safe assumptions. So for Christians and Catholics, we all have to be more intentional to influence things. Homeschooling is not an easy thing to do. So I think it's good to do but not easy. And you yeah. would have to actually know what they're capable of dealing with in terms of stress, That's in terms right. of self-discipline and selflessness. And, and sometimes we don't have examples to the left and right. That makes it challenging. You know? Part of what's going on anytime you do something with the big family is depending upon the level, you do have to involve the children in putting their own mental machinery to a problem so that they actually can take ownership with you of a family challenge. The Liturgy of the Hours is really amazing because it's the beauty of the Psalms. And the Psalms, it's meditative by nature. When we started doing it in the family, you mentioned this is how Jabari learned to read because you and I would be doing it and he'd follow along. And then I remember one time we were on a trip and we were challenging each other on how to actually memorize some of the Psalms. And it's like, this is amazing how exciting it was. The necessary things for a family rosary is it's the liturgy you can control. You can say, listen, family, we've got to do this because our family needs a family prayer. And the rosary ought to be that. So we'll typically pray the rosary at night and we'll pray the morning prayer in the breviary in the morning. It gives us time to actually get into the day and often the kids will, by attraction to the Psalms, wanna get down to pray. It's really a lovely moment. Children, they, they carry with them this kind of strong sense of what's good about life. Yeah. They're not questioning goodness and enjoyment because it's almost as if that's preserved in our faith. We can enjoy life and also know what's right and wrong. Uh, our sons having regular confession, they serve the Mass, and it's very powerful to watch the young men do that and access to their parish priest, his interest in their good and their moral upbringing has been very powerful. Holy God, we praise thy name. Lord of all, we bow before thee. It's very enjoyable to sing together. And it just so naturally flows. And as the kids get older, they just catch on. And they're like, I want to try that. And Sacred music only. Yeah, and everything else is censored. Yeah. I mean, the, the We're joy is We're going to chant that, over here and yeah. nothing else. No. <laughs> That's right. Well, one of the times we were, we went for a walk and the kids, they sang every verse of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. 
and the children will observe dynamics because they know how it's supposed to deliver and that these kids know that they need each other. It's really amazing to witness the possibilities when there are more voices. And people will say, oh, you got a football team or you got a baseball team. It's like, yeah, I also got a chorus. You can't believe it. When you're newly married, okay, it's gonna be honeymoon period for a while, but you have a baby together, and then now that's a forcing function to figure out how to work together better as a couple. And it's really something about the sacramental nature of marriage is whenever you have a baby, there is this possibility of just unbridled, loveliness and joy. Like when Steven, who's five months old now, when he's around and he's excited, you just say now, who can resist being joyful? And all of the family, we continue to have these opportunities because God has given us one more life. And it's this one more opportunity to have this such pure, sweet joy. And you can't just, you can't estimate how much God is doing. You know, we're all in this together. We're all advancing towards heaven. Like the road to heaven, being able to work through with somebody in that level of depth is when you share children together. And where else would you? Yeah, I thought that's right. Where else would you? And why to? wouldn't you regard it as such a immeasurable wealth of experience and opportunity to figure yourself out? We are the Jillick family, and, and we, we are joyful!